And so John chapter 5, if you would open your Bibles to John 5, if you don't have one, there should be one close to your chair or even under your chair, pick it up, John 5. Why don't we stand together and we will read the Word of God. I'll start at verse 31 and we'll look at through the end of the chapter today. John 5, 31 says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. But I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself, who sent me, has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men and I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I've come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who seek who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how, you will, be, how will you believe my words? Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would help us believe the words of Jesus, that you would help us believe the testimonies about Jesus. See him for who he truly is, in fact, in truth, exactly as the Bible proclaims. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word today. We pray that you would teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Every trial attorney wants a star witness. Legal cases, and especially criminal cases, they can rise and fall based on the quality of of the witnesses. One of the huge criminal cases when I was in college, uh, which I can't believe was 20 years ago, uh, was the O.J. Simpson murder trial. And many of you guys remember that, right? Every day, new headlines coming in from who was on the witness stand. One of them, Cato Kalin, remember? Uh, he gained about as much notoriety he did as the attorneys did. <laughs> really kind of unclear which side of the case he helped more. You know, definitely not an example of a star witness. The value of the witness hinges on his or her credibility, right? The more credible, the more power they lend to their testimony, and of course, thus to the case. Jesus had some stellar witnesses. Now, he didn't need them necessarily, but the people listening to Jesus did. They needed some reason to believe that the person that was standing right in front of them was indeed the Son of God. And Jesus, of course, had made some pretty big claims, and they needed some pretty good reasons to believe them. Of course, Jesus already gave them everything that they needed. They just needed to be willing to open up their eyes and their ears, be willing to believe. Now, we need to remember the context because we're picking up at the very end of a confrontation that Jesus had with the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem. He had come to Jerusalem for another feast, and while there, he went to uh, what had really become a famous pool named Bethesda, where people had often gone to for healing. Now, Jesus, obviously, he wasn't needing healing himself, but there he encountered a man who had been ill for 38 years, and he had sat at the poolside for however long, day in and day out, trying to get into this pool to get healed, unable to do so. Jesus offered to heal him. The man didn't quite understand what Jesus was doing. But Jesus healed him anyway, demonstrating the tremendous power of God. Now, that ought to have been a reason for great rejoicing, but instead it caused a scandal among the religious authorities. Jesus had healed the man on a Sabbath day. And so when the Jews got involved, they began persecuting Jesus, which only intensified after Jesus places himself on the same level as God the Father. The Jews rightly understood Jesus was making a claim to deity, and so they wanted to kill him. And so that's where this speech started. Jesus spoke in his own defense, showing that the Son only did what the Father did, that the Son was to be honored, just as the Father was to be honored. That the Son gives life, just as the Father gives life. That the Father has given the Son the authority to 
uh, have healing and life in himself and to, to judge the world and that the Father gave the Son the authority to call forth the resurrection and that the Son only seeks to do the Father's will. Those are some pretty big claims. All 100% true, but why should the Jews believe him? You know, if some random guy came up to us claiming to be God, we would rightly think he was crazy. Why should the Jews think any differently about Jesus? Because Jesus had already provided all the proof that was necessary. There were already abundant witnesses that testified of the deity of Christ. If the Jews truly belonged to God, they would recognize the witnesses that Jesus gave. So we want to listen up. We want to pay attention to the evidence. The witnesses speak loudly to the truth of Jesus Christ. And so we pick up in verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now in verse 30, Jesus made it clear that his power and his authority came from the Father because he sought the will of the Father who sent him. He didn't seek his own will. He sought the will of the Father. So Jesus does nothing of his own accord, and neither does he testify of himself. Verse 30 is really kind of a bridge between the previous section and this one. Some of this really goes back to the idea in Deuteronomy chapter 19, and Jesus used the same idea with his disciples when he was teaching them about church discipline, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter should be established. Multiple witnesses were required by Hebrew law to legally prove something true, and Jesus certainly had multiple witnesses concerning himself. A lone self-witness, obviously, isn't very reliable in a court of law. There isn't much reason to believe somebody who's the only person to speak of him or herself, especially when it comes to credentials. You know, you might put somebody in a witness stand and they say, oh, yeah, I'm a rocket scientist. How's anybody supposed to know? I need to see a degree. I need to talk to somebody. I need to know the proof behind all of this. All right. Now, for those who are familiar with the Gospel of John, this might seem to raise a problem later on when we get to chapter 8. Because there, Jesus seems to say exactly the opposite of what he does here in verse 31. Put it up on the screen for you. John 8, 13 through 14, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I'm from, I know where I'm going. You do not know where I come from and where I'm going. Verse 31 of chapter 5, he said, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So which is it? Is this a contradiction in the Bible? No. The issues are different, so thus is the response different. In chapter 5, Jesus is reaching out, with the, uh, for, uh, reaching out to the Jews, graciously providing his credentials, something he didn't need to do. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. In chapter 8, Jesus is responding to the accusations of the Jews. About the facts. And you know, facts are just facts. Jesus is God, and it didn't matter whether or not the Jewish authorities believed it. it. didn't matter if they believed that Jesus was the only person claiming it or not. That is the truth. You see some people's resumes out there, and you know, a person who puffs up a resume without any proof, not really a lot of reason to be believed. But you know what? If everything on that resume is incredible, if it, sounded, if it was actually true, well, it doesn't change the facts, and does it? It doesn't matter if anybody else believes it or attests to it or not. The truth of the matter doesn't change. The facts is that everything that Jesus claimed is true. And what we see here is that Jesus had the advantage of both being factual and having others testify on his behalf. He goes on to tell that, verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. First thing we've got to ask is who's the another? There's another who witnesses some Bible versions capitalize uh, the word another. They capitalize the pronoun he, inferring that it's a witness and a reference to God. If we take it in context with the very next verse, chapter th uh, verse 33, it might seem to be a reference to John the Baptist. So which is it? Well, either, either interpretation really could be valid. And Jesus used a present tense here in referring to the person who witnessed of him. John's ministry had pretty much come to an end by this point. He was in prison God the Father, of course, always bore witness of Jesus and continues to do so. But of course, both people are included in Jesus' list of references that we're going to go through here, so both obviously speak the truth. Really, the question is, what does it mean to bear witness? This particular word, and it's translated different ways here in the English, but it's used in its various forms 11 times in this section. It's a huge part of the theme here, right? The word is martyreo, where we get the, the verb form... Uh, Really, the verb form of where we get the word martyr. We know the word martyr. 
And it means exactly as it's translated, martyr, right? To testify, to bear witness, to attest, affirm, to provide information about something that we have a personal knowledge of. Of course, that's not the way we use the term martyr today. When we think of martyrs today, we speak of those who give their lives. Why? Because they attest to the truth of Jesus Christ and refuse to turn away from him. Now, that's a definition that's developed over time. Originally, a martyr would be the equivalent of any witness. If a person gave a testimony about anything, they were being a martyr. Now, in this sense, everything about our lives speaks some sort of testimony, doesn't it? Everything does. Our iTunes, our CD collection, whatever, they speak to our taste of music. They testify of that. Our pantries, our refrigerators, speaks of what we value in our food. Our calendars speak to our priorities in our schedule, bank statements or priorities in our pocketbook, all, all the rest. We all testify of something. The question is, what is it that we're testifying of? What do our lives bear witness to? And it might be different what we want our lives to be bearing witness to. Ultimately, the church has been given the responsibility of bearing witness to Jesus. Acts 1.8, he says, you shall be my witnesses. Now, thankfully, that's not a task in which we're alone. First of all, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do it. That's a major part of Acts 1.8. But to the context here, uh, Jesus has more than just two or three witnesses, more than just a church now, but he has more than two or three witnesses testifying on his behalf. He has four witnesses. Before the church ever existed, even while the disciples are still coming to an understanding of who Jesus is, Jesus already had several witnesses who testify, told, bore witness of him. Verse 31, here's the first. You've sent to John, and he's borne witness to the truth. Witness number one is John the Baptist. John the Baptist. John had already been established as a credible witness among the Jews. The Jewish authorities, remember, they had sent to John. They'd even inquired of him, asking if he was the Messiah. Chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. People respected John as a prophet, even if they couldn't quite figure him out. They had a tough time with that. They knew he spoke the truth. They listened to him in all kinds of matters. He preached a message of repentance to everybody who came, Jews, tax collectors, Roman soldiers, and he would preach to every single one of them. Lots of things that he said, but you know what? In all of that, in every one of his messages that he preached, testifying of Jesus was his primary mission. Everything else he taught was gravy. They listened to him on ethical matters and doctrinal things and things of reform and morals, the need for repentance. But if they did all that and still ignored John and what he said concerning the Messiah, then they missed the whole point of his mission. Preparing the way for Jesus was his reason for existence. That was precisely the reason God sent John and called him in the first place. By the way, the church shares this much in common with John. This is also our reason for existence. If the church isn't testifying of Jesus Christ, then we're missing the point. The church isn't supposed to be a feel-good club. It's not a do-good club. It's not a legalistic be-good club. All those things miss the point. We're to testify of the good Son of God. We're to tell others the good gospel. Everything else has to flow from that starting point or we've missed it. Before we move on, we need to ask, what about your individual faith? Is it based on anything else but that truth of the identity of Jesus? So many people think they're saved because, you know, the good outweighs the bad. They think. It never does, by the way. It never will. They think that, you know, God's just a really kind of nice, forgiving guy in eternity anyway. Please know that's a false faith, faith that sends millions of people to hell. That's all based on the feel good, do good, be good ideas that have little to nothing to do with biblical Christianity. Those who are saved by God are saved by one reason alone. Our faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. If we don't know who he is, if we don't believe upon the things that he's done, if that's not the very foundation upon which our faith hangs, then we are not saved, period. Now, the good news is that everything that the Bible says about the personal work of Jesus is what? The truth. That's what John testified to. He testified to the truth. And this is what Jesus goes on to say, that the other witnesses testified to the truth, but also, of course, about John's own testimony. John the Baptist had not lied to the people. He hadn't misled the people. He spoke the truth. When John proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, that wasn't a matter of opinion. That is a matter of fact, right? 
Not just enough to have faith, you have to have faith in the truth. Faith in the truth saves. Lots of people have faith in all kinds of things. But those kind of things can't save, only Jesus can. Verse 34, yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. Notice why Jesus says all of these witnesses, starting with John the Baptist. The reason why is so that we might be saved. Let's think about this for a minute. Almighty God, of course, has uh, no need for any backup from man. Creator God doesn't need anybody to vouch for his character, right? He's perfectly capable on his own. The witnesses that Jesus lists off here, all four of them that we're going to talk about, were not given for Jesus' benefit. They're given for ours, right? From God's perspective, testimony about him that's acceptable to man, well, that's completely unnecessary because God isn't the one who needs to have faith in Jesus in order to be saved. We do. God would still be God if everybody got saved or nobody got saved. It doesn't change the fact that he's God doesn't change a fact regarding the truth. So God does not need those witnesses, but we do. And the fact that God gave so many witnesses concerning his son, what is that? That's a demonstration of his compassion and his mercy and his grace. He's giving us, look at this one and this one and this one and this one. Listen to all of these, and now you can know, now you can be saved. See, God wants us to be saved. Why did he send John? To prepare the way for the Savior. Why did he send Peter and Paul and the other apostles? So that people might be saved. God sent men and women throughout history bearing witness of him that the world could hear come to faith and be saved. That is his merciful outreach. This is God's grand desire for all the world. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So specifically, this is God's desire for you. God wants you to be saved and he's reached out in all kinds of ways for you to know the truth. Back about John in verse 35, he was a burning and shining lamp. You were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So John the Baptist, he was faithful to his mission. He shone as a lamp for Christ. He was steadfast in his calling and in his testimony. And the Jews, they'd listen for a while, but they didn't listen for too long, right? Because John was taken and he was imprisoned by King Herod. Later on, he would be killed for speaking the truth, by the way. But when John's removed from the scene, all these people that he preached repentance to, they just go back to life as usual. At one point, it seemed like the whole nation had come out to John to be baptized, but the repentance was short-lived. They rejoiced in the light, but they didn't stay in the light. Rejoicing in the light's really, really, really good, but it needs to be deeper than that. It needs to be based on sincere faith. Otherwise, any change that comes is just surface level. It's temporary. You know, it's possible to rejoice in the things of God without actually having faith in the Son of God. And we want to beware that we don't confuse godly sentiments for the God the Son. We've got to have Jesus. John was a lamp, by the way, so are we. It's another thing we share in common with them. As a church, we're supposed to shine the light of Jesus into the world. We're to witness of Christ, just all the prophets of God witnessed of Jesus, witnessed of God throughout the centuries. It's our same calling, our same mission. Verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So the first witness was John. Witness number two are his works. Jesus' works, his deeds, his miracles, his mission. All of the things that God the Father gave Jesus to do testify of Jesus. And guess what? They're actually greater than the witness of John the Baptist. He said, well, how do you make that out? Because that seems kind of weird. One's done, and you've got to look at it through actions. One's done when John's actually speaking to people. That seems a lot more direct. Well, John was a powerful witness, and he could speak directly concerning the identity of Jesus, and he did so. But the difference is, is that John could speak of Jesus. Jesus could personally work. Listening to John is great, but at best, that's secondhand. People could go to Jesus and see Jesus' works for themselves firsthand. So the actions spoke louder than the words because those actions came directly from the Son of God. Question, which works, by the way? Well, all of them. Of course, the greatest work would come at the cross and the resurrection. Jesus' work on the cross was the act that completed the work of God on our behalf, paying everything, all of our debt that we owed from our sin. Jesus' resurrection from the grave is the definitive statement that He is the Son of God and that His death on our behalf was truly sufficient. Truly, that is the pinnacle of the work of Christ. Yet, remember, when Jesus is speaking here, that's still in the future. 
many, many months, a couple years even. Although it's surely in view, Jesus spoke of something more. He's speaking to everything he did. All of the miracles, all of the teachings, all of the demonstrations of his identity, his works. By the way, works is plural for that reason. Jesus' greatest work of the cross is, or greatest work is accomplished at the cross and resurrection, but that wasn't all that he did. His whole ministry is a testimony to his identity. Note a couple things here. First, the Father gave Jesus the works to do given by the Lord. Second, the works specifically testify that the Father sent Jesus. What does it speak? It speaks of his divine identity, and it speaks of his divine mission. Even Nicodemus and the other Pharisees understood this. Remember when Jesus was in Jerusalem for the first time for the feast? Nicodemus is talking to him, and he noted, nobody can do these things that you do unless God is with him. In John 3, verses 1 and 2. The miracles that Jesus performed were an essential component to his testimony and his credentials. And it brings up a good question then. Do, do miracles prove God's favor and blessing upon a person? Not necessarily. Can't really say that. Miracles by themselves, I mean, signs and wonders, they could really go either way, couldn't they? Miracles could be demonically inspired, and you see that around the world. Miracles could be faked, manipulated by men. A show of what appears to be supernatural doesn't really prove anything. But see, Jesus' miracles were different. There are no tricks or illusions with him. and That's evident from the specific context here, the specific miracle that spawned this whole confrontation with the authorities. Jesus has healed a man that had been sick for 38 years. You can't manipulate that. That's not something, you know, David Blaine or David Copperfield or whoever the latest one is going to bring out on a stage and just fake it. You can't do that. Both the quantity and the quality of Jesus' miracles were undeniable. What Jesus did was something that hadn't been seen in Israel since the days of Elijah, hadn't been seen since the days of Moses, and even then it didn't compare with those guys, because Jesus did it on a daily basis, multitudes of times on the streets of Jerusalem, the shores of Galilee. Jesus' work stood far out from the rest. There's simply no way to see them and not see God's power and calling about Jesus. By the way, speaking of God the Father, he goes on to say in verse 37, the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. Here's witness number three, God the Father. It wasn't just the works that God gave Jesus to do that testified of Jesus. God the Father himself bore witness of Jesus. He said, when did he do that? Well, a couple times. One was publicly at his baptism, though it seemed to be misunderstood by those who were listening. He did another time privately with just a few of the disciples at Jesus' transfiguration, which was still to happen in the future. At both events, the voice of God came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Really kind of tough to get a stronger testimony than God the Father saying that from heaven, right? That's pretty specific. But beyond this, God the Father testified of Jesus in the heart's of those who listen to him. Jesus is going to say later on in chapter 6 that no one comes to him in faith unless the Father draws them to him. John 6, 44. And so the fact that Jesus had any disciples at all was the proof of the testimony of God regarding him because some were drawn already. They were drawn by God. So the Father did indeed testify of Jesus. But you know what? The Jews wouldn't have been able to recognize it if they tried, not without faith. Why is that? Well, because Jesus said, you hadn't even heard God, you hadn't seen him at any time. He said, wait a second, I remember a specific time in Deuteronomy and Exodus. What about Mount Sinai? Well, the Hebrews heard the voice of God then. Well, yes, they did. They did hear the voice of God for themselves, and they were terrified. And see, that, that's the whole point. They heard God, they were so frightened that they begged God to speak to God on their behalf because they didn't want to hear God anymore. The Hebrews hadn't heard God speak to them in millennia, and they refused it the one time that they did. And even when the word of God came to them through the prophets, they always turned away from it. God had reached out to them countless times through their generations, and they consistently refused the word of God. They were the people of God, but they didn't know God. They didn't recognize God when they saw him, and their rejection of Jesus is proof. What did Jesus tell Philip later on? He who has seen me has seen the Father, John 14, 9. The fact that they didn't see the Father in Jesus while he was standing right there is proof. They didn't know God at all. 
That's the whole crux of the problem was obvious they didn't know the Father. They hadn't been transformed by his word because they didn't believe the one the Father had sent. If they had truly known God as their God, then they would have recognized the things that God did. His word would have been abiding in them and would have naturally recognized the hand of God at work. You know, if you know somebody, you recognize their handiworks, their desires, their intents. We're walking through the mall. We're going past certain shops, and I can see, well, Olivia would love that dress, and Marilyn would hate it. And Marilyn would love that dress, and Olivia would hate it. Because you know them. So you can see what they would like, what they wouldn't like. Art experts, you know, they can identify Van Gogh's and Picasso's and Jackson Pollock's and all these other artists that I don't know anything about, but they can identify just by, because they can see the handiwork in them. If you know anything about the artist, you can recognize. If you don't, you won't recognize anything when you see it. It just looks like a blob of stuff up there. The Jews didn't know anything about God, so they didn't recognize anything about his son. They didn't recognize God's calling upon his life. A lot of people can know about a lot of godly stuff without knowing God. They can know a lot of things about church without knowing Christ. Well, the Jews, they knew a lot about the religion, but they knew nothing, little to nothing, about the God they were supposedly worshiping in their religion. And so many people today do the same thing. They know what to do when they walk through the door of a church, but they don't know the God they're supposed to be worshiping when they do. But you can. Verse 39. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So here's witness number four, the Scriptures. The Bible testifies of Christ. Which part? All of it. All of it. After all, which Scriptures are Jesus referring to here? The Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament when Jesus was speaking this. It wasn't yet written. It would be written years later. The only Bible they had was the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament obviously, and overtly speaks of Jesus. But guess what? So does the Old Testament. The person, the grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ is found through all the pages of the Old Testament. Jesus is prophesied in the Garden of Eden. He's shown when Noah is sealed up in the ark. He's personally promised to the patriarchs. He's demonstrated in the life of Joseph. He's pictured graphically in the Passover. He's shown in every single sacrifice throughout Leviticus. He's sung throughout the Psalms, proclaimed through the prophets, and so much more. If we don't see Jesus in the Old Testament, it's not because he's not there. It's because we're not looking. Ultimately, the whole book speaks of him. By the way, this goes to the fundamental purpose of the Bible, by the way, because it's not about us. It's about him. Bible is in a rule book. It's not a how-to manual. It's a testimony of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. It tells the story how God writes every wrong through Jesus Christ. It's about him, and we need to read it with him in mind. And, and so the Jews, they look to the Scriptures to find life for good reason, right? It's the Word of God. The problem was they knew the words without knowing the meaning. They could recite the content, but they didn't understand the context. They looked to the Bible with an intellectual pursuit. They weren't seeking God. And what's the point of studying the Scriptures if you're not looking to know the author who inspired them? The Jews at the time, they didn't know God, so it didn't do much good to memorize the Bible. The written word is always supposed to point us to the living word of Jesus. The Scriptures always point to Jesus. To study the first without going to the second is, again, to miss a point. And people do this all the time. Go down a list of liberal seminaries. You can find all sorts of Highly, highly educated Bible scholars, multiple doctorates who can quote scriptures in the original languages. But if they got no faith in Christ, all that knowledge is meaningless. It's vanity. It doesn't matter how much you know if you don't first know Jesus. Now, that's not an excuse not to know anything. We're most definitely to study the scriptures, show ourselves approved. But we do so from a foundation of faith. It's only when we know Christ that we truly understand the word of God at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 goes into great detail about that. Anyway, verse 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So here's the problem, right? It's a matter of the will. God was perfectly willing to save them through Christ. They were not willing to go through Christ to be saved. God had provided everything they needed to know of Jesus and to go to him for salvation. He said as much in verse 34, I say these things to you, why? That you may be saved. So the hang up isn't with God. It was with themselves. God provided the testimony. They had to choose to believe it. They had to choose to respond to it. If they weren't willing to do it, then they would never what? They'd never have life. 
So faith, what do we know then? Faith involves the will. Are we willing? We've said it before. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but not everybody wants to go through Jesus to get there. They love their sin more than they love salvation. They would rather, and spoke to many people, they'd rather perish in their rebellion than surrender themselves to God. And guess what? God does give us that choice. He gives us a choice to respond to his loving offer of grace or to turn away from him and perish. Not a single person in hell is going to honestly be able to claim that it's God's fault that they're there. God's already reached out to us graciously, multiply. We've got to be willing to respond to him. Verse 41, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. Other Bible versions translate verse 41 more accurately when they translate the word glory instead of honor. Glory. The word actually is doxa, where we get our word doxology from, glory from, right? Usually speaks of the brightness, the splendor, the glory of God. We often use it when describing worship. Now, obviously, Jesus is worshipped by men. He says, I don't receive worship, I don't receive glory from men. Jesus is worshipped by men. It will be worshipped by men and women throughout eternity. will be among them giving him glory in heaven. But that's not the idea here, okay? The whole context has been the various testimonies concerning Jesus. Now, all these witnesses appointed to Christ so that people might believe and be saved. They just weren't willing to be saved. But all that, the witnesses testifying, that's not egotistical on Jesus' part. Right? He's not seeking honor for himself. He's not seeing glory for his benefit. He didn't need the approval of the Jews to have a valid ministry. That's not what it was all about. That kind of glory, that kind of honor, that was unnecessary. He wasn't seeking it, that sort of thing out. He didn't receive it. And it goes back to the idea, doesn't it, that God is God and we're not? We don't give God permission to do anything. We don't need to give him approval to do anything. For instance, we have to be willing to go to Jesus to be saved, but we don't give permission for God to save us. There's a big difference between those two things. God already extended his permission when he extended his invitation. We just respond to what he's done. Right? Likewise, we don't give the Holy Spirit permission to come into our lives and fill us with his presence. We ask the Holy Spirit to do so in submission to the will of God for us. But he's got permission. He's God. That's, that's who he is. Even if Jesus did receive honor from men, it wouldn't have mattered because these men wouldn't honor him anyway. Jesus knew them. And he knew that they didn't have faith in God. True faith in God would be demonstrated by the existence of the love of God within them. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. And it's something that God generates within anyone who has faith in Christ. When we look at the context here, the love of God, is this the love that we have for God? Or is this the love of God within us that we have for others? And the answer is absolutely yes, both. The grammar could go either way. The overall point is the same, though. The only reason the love of God exists within our heart is because of the work of God that he has accomplished in our salvation. In fact, John goes on to explain this later on in one of his letters. 1 John 4, 7 through 9 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. If we know God, if we're born of God, we'll love God. And guess what? If we love God, then we're going to start loving as God loves. We're going to love whom God loves. That's all part of the transformation that takes part in our lives when we are born again. The love that you believe is impossible for certain people and I know you, I know me. There are certain people I think that is impossible to love that person. Guess what? It becomes possible because that love doesn't come from you anyway. It comes from God. And see, this is how Jesus knew that they didn't have any faith. They didn't have any love. Jesus knows the difference. He knows our hearts. Remember, he's speaking to Jewish scholars, Jewish authorities. They could put on the best of religious appearances, and they were doing so because they were condemning him for breaking the Sabbath and for blasphemy but they couldn't change their insides. Jesus could see their hearts, and he could see that they had no love and they knew nothing of God. Verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. So Jesus wasn't received by the Jews, but there would be others who come in the future who would be. There would be false messiahs and imposters. They'd come in promoting themselves. They would be received, but not Jesus. Why? Well, simply put, because people love darkness rather than the light, John 3, 19. Not just a problem, of course, among the ancient Jews. Churches do the same thing when we exchange the truth for a lie. 
When churches depart from a gospel of grace to a gospel of works, it's the same thing. When they seek out emotional highs for the sake of entertainment rather than the giver of miracles and the glory of God, it's the same thing. When churches embrace false teaching, it's when they reject the truth of Jesus. They fall into the same trap. And all that stuff can be clothed in spirituality. Have a look of church stuff about it. Still have nothing to do with Christ. Jesus had the testimony of God, but that wasn't enough. People wanted the flash. They wanted the flesh-driven testimony of men. And in the process, they leave themselves open to all kinds of deception. So he says in verse 44, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? That's a great question, isn't it? Hebrews eleven six tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to him must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. They had to have true faith. The Jews, they're too busy to impress one another rather than seeking the true glory of God. They missed out on it. Verse 45, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. So what happens to the Jews then? After they've rejected the true testimonies of Jesus, if they sought out false glory and honor, what happens? Well, like everybody else, they're going to have to stand before God at the judgment. And there they will find themselves condemned. Jesus already spoke of the judgment earlier on in chapter 5, saying that he had the authority to judge. Chapter 5, verse 27. What he adds here is that, guess what? I'm not the only person you're going to see there. The Jews would also see Moses. Moses being the foundational prophet of the Hebrews. It was in his writings, in the scriptures, that the Jews looked to for life. What they would discover in that future day is that Moses would not defend them through the scriptures. He would accuse them. Why is that? Verse 46, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Why would Moses accuse the Jews? Because although they studied his writings, they didn't believe what he wrote. They would find themselves condemned by the same scriptures that they trusted in for eternal life. How so? Well, Moses wrote the law. The Jews put their hope in the law. They put their hope in the covenant they had with God through the law. But the law points us to Jesus. It's not a replacement for Jesus. The law shows us our need for salvation, and when rightly used, causes us to fall upon the mercy and grace of God through Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, the law does nothing but leave us condemned before God. That's no different with us than it was for the Jews. Moses couldn't save them. Moses didn't save them because that was not his role. John made it clear in his prelude for the law, verse 117, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, certainly Moses wrote about the coming grace of God through Jesus Christ. Every bit of it, though, demonstrated through the law. For instance, it wasn't the sacrifices that saved the Hebrews, was it? It was the grace of God. What did the sacrifices do? Well, the sacrifices continually reminded them of their need for grace, reminded them of their sin that needed to be covered over. It was always pointing the Hebrews to Jesus, but the Jews, they lost sight of it. They didn't see it. They were caught up in their legalism, trying to prove themselves worthy in their own eyes. That's the wrong use of the law. But even beyond the wrong use of the law was a simple lack of faith in what was written overtly about Jesus. Keep in mind, the Old Testament is, again, filled with prophecies and direct references to Christ. And if the Jews had believed the writings of Moses and all the other prophets, and he's representing all of them here, then they would have been longing for the coming of the Messiah, and they would have rejoiced when Jesus finally came. Why is it that only a handful of magi from a pagan country, from a pagan religion, recognized the prophecies and came to the birth? Or not to the birth, but a couple years after the birth, to seek out the baby Jesus and nobody else did because they didn't believe what Moses had written. They didn't believe Moses, so they didn't believe Jesus. If they didn't believe Jesus, they could not be saved. So many witnesses were given. So many credible sources gave testimony to the Jews that Jesus is the Son of God. You have John the Baptist. You have the works and miracles of Jesus. You have God the Father. You have the Holy Scriptures. All testify that Jesus is the Son of God, sent by God to save the world. And of course, to judge it in the last day, it should have been so plain to the Jews, but they rejected the testimonies that they were given. They were left then without excuse. You know, for as much as the Jews received, we have been given so much more. We not only have the Old Testament with all the prophecies and the types and the pictures, We have the historical fulfillment of these things. 
We have the completed cross and resurrection. We have the ongoing testimony of the Holy Spirit. We have the full canon of Scripture. And especially here in the United States, we've heard the gospel in so many ways that we lost count. We live in a culture that is simultaneously saturated in the gospel and soundly rejects it at the same time. Surely we have far fewer excuses than the Jews did of Jesus' day. So let me ask you, if you don't believe, what will it take for you to believe? Because all the needed testimony, that's already been given. God's reached out in a myriad of ways that he never had to do. But he did it anyway out of his great love for us. So you need to make the choice to believe. Bend your will to the will of God so that you might be saved. That is God's will and his desire for your life. But you've got to respond to him in faith. Now, for those of us who are already Christian, it's a great reminder to us because we've got to ask if our faith is built on anything else except this factual reality about Jesus. Because we can start basing it on this, that, and the other thing, but it's got to come back to the person, the identity of Jesus Christ. That is the start, the middle, and the end of our faith. Do we trust that true testimony of God regarding His Son? And if we do, then what is it that we're witnessing? We are going to be witnesses one way or the other. We can either take two people to Jesus or we can take them away from Jesus. We've got to be mindful of our own mission and our own calling to testify of the risen Son of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much for sending Jesus and for making Jesus so very plain to us. You wanted us You wanted the Jews then, you want us today to know him, to see him as Lord, to know that he's God and be saved. That's your desire. That's your purpose. That's your intent. Lord, and I pray that you would help us see that for what it is and respond to it. Lord, first I would pray for those who to this point, have not been willing to go through Jesus to be saved. Well, they want to go to heaven, but they just, they didn't want to surrender their life to Jesus as Lord. Father, help them see you for who you are. Help them see Jesus for everything that he's done for them. Help them see their sin for what it really is, and then Use that, Lord, to cause them to tremble and fall on their knees, asking Jesus, please save me today. I'm sorry. Lord, give them the words to respond to Jesus as the living God that he is who died for them at the cross, lives today. Help them surrender themselves to Jesus Lord, you don't need our permission, but you do desire us to surrender our will and respond to you. So, Lord, help us do so. Father, for the rest of us who know Jesus as our Lord and been walking with him for a while, help us have no other foundation than that which has already been laid for us in Jesus. Help us be filled with the Spirit so that, Lord, we would be effective witnesses unto Jesus. Help everything in our lives ultimately point back to Jesus and not away from him. Lord, forgive us for where we failed and fill us with your spirit for this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.